Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat in which we would look at CPA questions specifically dealing with FAR. These questions could also appear in an, in an intermediate accounting course and the topic is the third taxes. A topic that's heavily covered and many students find hard time understanding this topic. However, I do have it heavily covered in my intermediate accounting course close to three, three and a half lectures and explanation. So I'm gonna work some questions, but I'm also tell you if you need more help, I have plenty of help about this topic, which will deter some students from even passing the exam. So I'm here to help you check out my intermediate accounting. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. YouTube is where you would need to subscribe. I have 1,700 plus accounting, auditing, tax, finance lectures, as well as Excel tutorial. If you like my lectures, please like them, share them, subscribe to the channel. If they benefit you, it means they might benefit other people. Share the wealth, connect with me on Instagram. On my website, farhatlectures.com, I have additional resources. In addition to the lectures, I have practice exercises, true, false, multiple choice, over 2,000 CPA questions, and this is where you'll be able to learn about the third income taxes in detail. So if you are looking to pass your CPA exam, add those 10 to 15 points, check out my website. It might help you do so. So let's take a look at the first question. Once again, this question deals with the third taxes. With regard to the third taxes, the use of the installment sales method for tax purposes would typically result in what? So if we use the installment sales method for tax purposes, what does it result into? Does it result into a deferred tax asset? Does it result into deferred tax liability? Both or neither. So, so the best way to approach this topic, which is this is how I teach deferred taxes on my website, is to look look at how how do we do this? How do we do, do things for taxes? And how do we do things for GAAP? So how do we do things for IRS and how do we do things for CAP? So if we're using the installment method for tax purposes, what is the installment method? The installment, me the installment method means every time you receive money, it's installment, you have a taxable transaction. Well, under the GAAP method, guess what? If you sell something under the GAAP method, if you sell something, if you completed the transaction, you don't have to wait for the cash. So if you sold something for, let's assume you sold something for, uh, $10,000 and you're going to receive five payments of 2000. So you, you made the sale, the sale is completed. You debit your account receivable, you credit sales, $10,000. This is what you did. But guess what? You are, you are going to be, you're going to be paid. This is year one. So this is for year one. You're not going to get anything for year one. What's going to happen is this starting in year two, you're going to start to receive the money and you're going to be receiving uh, let's make it two payments. So you're going to be receiving year two and year three. So as far as gap, the sales is recorded in year one. As far as tax, you don't do you don't do anything for tax purposes because you did not receive any money for this sale. In other words, it's not really a sale. It's not a taxable event. But here's what's going to happen. As soon as you booked ten thousand dollar in sales. This is going to generate kind of kind of a future tax liability. Why? Because what's going to happen in year two and year three, you're going to get five thousand dollars and five thousand dollars. Therefore, in year two, you debit cash five thousand, you'll credit sales five thousand, and in year three, you will debit cash five thousand, and you will credit sales five thousand. What does that mean? It means for tax purposes. It means for tax purposes, you are going to have a future ten thousand of revenue, which you already accounted for under GAAP. What does that mean? That's going to give you a future tax liability. If you have a future revenue that's going to be taxable, that's basically the definition of a, a future tax liability. You're going to have an obligation down the road to pay taxes. In year two and year three, what's going to happen when you, for GAAP, for GAAP, all you have to do is debit cash, credit receivable for 5000 every year. So you have no revenue. The revenue will start to appear on your taxes in year two and year three, which in turn gives you a future tax liability. So it's very important. So why why is the third taxes uh, challenging? I'm not going to say difficult because you need to know your knowledge from tax. You need to know accounting rules and you need to combine those two together. So you need to know your tax and your accounting principles and how do they interact together. So it's very important that you have a good understanding about this topic. And I could assure you, many students, when they come to me for help, usually that's the topic that they're, 
that they're ch that they're being challenged with it's either this or pension those are the two main topics let's take a look at this question station toy train a cash basis taxpayer prepares accrual basis financial statements and year 13 balance sheet state state and deferred income tax liability increase compared to year 12. so we have deferred tax liability and all what we're saying for example the deferred tax liability was five thousand now it became fifteen thousand that's all what we're saying so it increased the deferred tax liability increase which of the following changes during year 13 would cause this increase in deferred tax liability so all what they're asking us is which of these would result which of these activities one two three would result in this I'm going to make a 10,000 increase. I made it 10,000, 5 to 15. So simply put, what would increase your deferred tax liability? That, that's the question. That's the question. So let's take a look at what we are giving and try to analyze it. Again, what I like, I'm going to, I'm going to grab this question and uh, work with it on, a, uh, on one note because I'm going to need more, infirm, more room to work with. So, um, so what, would lead, what would lead to this increase in deferred tax liability? Ability. let's take a look at what we have all right an increase in prepaid expense uh, I'm sorry in prepaid insurance so let's see so we have tax and we have gap okay so what happened when we buy prepaid if we increase in prepaid when we increase in prepaid what do we do for gap for gap we debit prepaid I don't know, prepaid insurance which is an asset and we credit cash again let's make it ten thousand and ten thousand so for gap when we when we had the increase in prepaid what happened is we increased an asset this is an asset and this is an asset now for tax purposes here's what's going to happen for tax purposes we are going to debit and expense ten thousand and we are going to credit cash ten thousand so what did really happen for tax purposes the increase in prepaid because for tax purposes you are going to expense it what happened is you used up all your expenses. What's going to happen is this. This is year one for both. What's going to happen in year two, let me change colors. In year two, basically in year two, there's no nothing about the tax because the whole amount was expense. In year two, you're going to have insurance expense and you're going to credit prepaid insurance for 5000 So notice what happened. You have an expense. On, on the books on gap but you have no expense for tax purposes so what did this what did this trigger it triggered an increase in your ta deferred tax liability simply put in year two you're going to have an increase in deferred tax liability because you already used up all all of your prepaid insurance in quote expense in year one so in year two and year three you're going to have an expense here so in year three same thing in year three you're going to have an insurance expense of 5,000 and you're gonna credit your prepaid insurance of 5,000 and you're gonna have nothing for tax purposes so as a result you took the expense up front you're gonna experience an increase in your you, you, you will experience an increase in your deferred tax liability so definitely one is one of the answers so we could eliminate a we could eliminate D okay now all we have to know all what we have to find out now is is two part of the answer or not because we know three is out because we have to have one if, if you understand that one is included three is out so let's take a look at two an increase in in rent receivable okay again let's do the same thing for an increase in rent receivable let's assume you rented something on account you rented something on account that's good so here we go we have gap and we have tax and you rented something on account for ten thousand dollar again let's use this number ten thousand dollar so for gap you are going to debit rent receivable 10k you're gonna credit credit rent revenue 10k for tax purposes if you receive no cash you have no tax yeah, it says year one you have no tax obligation why because you did not receive any cash it was an increase in rent receivable now what's going to happen in year two let's assume you're going to be paid that money in year two to keep the example simple so in year two what's going to happen is for gap they're going to give you the money you're going to debit cash ten thousand you're going to credit rent receivable ten thousand and we are basically done but there's no revenue in year two in year two for tax purposes you are going to debit cash 
10,000 and you're gonna credit rent revenue 10,000 so what happened when you had this receivable in year one what happened it triggered a future tax liability of 10,000 it tells you in the future you're gonna be receiving ten thousand dollar it means you're gonna have a future tax liability what does that mean it means yes indeed an increase in receivable an increase in rent receivable will increase your deferred tax liability because it's it's increasing your obligation into the future your tax obligation and we know three is not correct because uh, by the process of elimination we said one is two but let's look at three just to make sure what would three would do anyway because it's very important so let's look at three three it says an increase in the liability for warranty obligation so again let's do gap and let's do this is gap and this is tax so what do we do well when we have an obligation when we have when we have a warranty what we do is we debit warranty expense let's make it ten thousand credit warranty obligation or warranty liability ten thousand so this is year one so in year one we estimate we're going to have a warranty expense next year of ten thousand dollars what do we do for tax purposes we don't do anything but what did this do well it tells us in the future we're going to have because you know this warranty is it, it's, it's an estimate for the future so in year two let's assume in year two we did have we did have actually the warranty therefore in year two we debit warranty expense let's assume we had to pay cash 10,000 we credit cash 10,000 for gap purposes in year two we debit warranty liability we debit warranty liability to remove the liability 10,000 and we credit cash 10,000 so notice what happened this liability for gap purposes in year one created a future deduction for us it's a warranty expense in year two so what would a future deduction gives us future deduction will lead to an increase in the third tax asset in other words it doesn't lead to an increase in a deferred tax liability okay so hopefully this makes sense why number three is not correct again you have to understand these topics in detail i understand if you're not following 100 percent here i'm just trying to work with people who already have an idea about the topic so they can try to practice but if you feel that you know I'm, I'm i'm a bit confused that's why i have my intermediate accounting go to my intermediate accounting lesson let's take a look at this question good this question had numbers so this will i'll give you a feeling about about the numbers okay uh, let's see a b company a newly organized company reported pre-tax financial income which is gap income of a hundred thousand for the current year among the item reported are premium on officer's life insurance with Befford as the owner and the beneficiary. So notice premium on life insurance with the company as the owner and the company is the beneficiary of $5,000. Interest received on municipal bond, $10,000. The enacted tax rate for the current year is 25% and 30% thereafter, and it's December 31st. What should the company report as deferred tax liability? So they're kind of they're leading you here and telling you this is it's going to be a deferred tax liability. And this is, they should have, if I was, if, you know, I would say the third tax liability or asset use, what are we going to have? Because uh, why the third tax liability? There's no reason. So this is an easy reason. You, if you get this question, this is an easy question. This is really easy. As long as you understand the following, as long as you understand that premium on officer's life insurance with the company as the owner, as the beneficiary is a permanent permanent difference and interest received on municipal bond also a permanent difference so both of these differences are permanent differences permanent means they, they are never taxable or never deductible so they will never they will never like for example we, we looked at the warranty expense the warranty expense was deductible down the road we looked at the rent the rent was taxable down the road so it's a temporary difference the premium on life insurance with the company as the owner and, and the beneficiary it's a permanent and interest received on this one it's a permanent this is this is a permanent non-deductible one is non-deductible the premium is non-deductible this is never not deductible under the circumstances and this is not taxable under any circumstances therefore we consider those elements as 
permanent and you need to understand that permanent differences would result in no deferred tax asset no deferred tax liability so knowing this information you would immediately zoom in and the answer is d it's there's no deferred tax asset no deferred tax liability as a result of those permanent differences in other words you need to be familiar with what are your permanent differences because if you get if they ask you about permanent differences those are easy questions there's no there's they don't affect the third tax asset they don't affect they don't affect the third tax liability easy question okay let's take a look at this question on june 20th year one b company leased the building and received rental payment in the amount of forty two thousand. the payment was for the rental period july 1st year one through july 1st year two B's tax rate are 25% uh, for year one, 30% for year two, assuming no other temporary differences, uh, and that the rental income is taxable when received. What amount of the third tax should Benson report in year one balance sheet? So I think I'm better off um, grabbing this and working with it on a note. So let me take a look at the note here. Let me grab this question. So they re received the money July 1st, year one. So let's see. Okay. So this is, so what you should do is something like this. So this way you see what's going on. We have year one and we have year two. I received the money July 1st, year one, and it's for July 1st, year two. So it's going to be covering this period and this period. So th they already told you th the money is taxable as soon as you get as soon as you receive it so as soon as i receive the money as soon as i receive the money i debit cap for tax purposes let's do tax and tax and gap and here's what's going to happen under tax under tax i have the cash forty-two thousand, and i will credit rent revenue forty-two thousand. okay because that's it and i'm going to be paying taxes on that rent revenue in year one in year one for gap, I'm gonna debit cash 42,000. I'm gonna credit rent revenue 21,000. It's for this period. Then I'm going to have unearned revenue of 22,000. Now, so for tax purposes, I'm practically done. I paid my taxes on that I obligation. I, I, I paid my taxes in year two. What's going to happen is this. In year two, there's nothing for tax purposes because I read that money has already been taxed. In year two, I'm going to debit unearned, sorry, I'm just unearned revenue, 21,000. This un, I'm going to debit unearned revenue and I'm going to debit oh, sorry, I didn't catch that. rent revenue, 21,000. Stop it, Eddie, please. Uh, I'm going to credit rent revenue of 21,000. So what happened is this. In the future, I'm going to have a rent revenue on gap, but it's not taxable because I already paid my taxes. So what is that going to do? Well, they already told you that's going to give you a deferred taxed asset. How much is the deferred taxed asset? Here, here we have to be very careful. And please listen to me carefully. So the amount of future revenue that's already been taxable is 21,000. Now the question is, do I multiply it by 25 or 30%? And you multiply it by the future tax rate 30%, because they're giving you the answer here as 25. You have to be very careful. I'm assuming that's 25. Let me just double check the math before I confuse you. Uh, so if we take 21,000 times 0.25, see, that's not the answer. Okay, they're giving you the answer. So you have to multiply it by the future enacted tax rate. Remember that. And sometimes they try to give you an easy question with the future enacted tax rate that's different. So I'm going to take 21,000 times 0.3, and that's going to give you 6,300. And the answer is BB as in boy. Okay. So um, again, what I can tell you about this topic, it's challenging for, for the students, for challenging for the students, but what I can do, I can help you. I help many students overcome this topic by referring to my intermediate accounting lectures, working my CPA questions. Um, check out my website. That's all what I suggest you do. It's a supplemental material to your CPA course, so you don't have to give up your CPA course. It's going to help your CPA course. Invest in your career. Invest in your professional education. You study for your CPA once. Good luck and stay safe, especially dur during those coronavirus days.